I welcome everybody today to our Tea Time Talk. I I'm Stephanie Schuler, and this, my co-host, is... I am Myron Manogarin, everybody. And we're from the Searle Team Center for ed Educational Research on Language and Literacies at the University of Toronto, OISE, the Ontario Studies for Instit uh, Institute Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, and we're excited to welcome Dr. Danielle Freitas, who is with our guest speaker today, and her title that she's going to be, her topic that she's ta going to be talking about is called Using Student Teachers' Cognitive Emotional Contradictions as a Powerful Tool to Support Teacher Learning and Development During Language Teacher Education Programs. We're going to tell you a little bit about the Tea Time Research Circles and Searle. And I'll hand it over to Myron. So thanks again, everybody, for coming. I know more people are rolling in, so maybe we might have to repeat this again towards the end. But um, the Tea Time Research Circle is a chance for um, some of our scholars in the LLE community and, of course, outside of that, to share um, some of the projects that they're currently working on. and where their research is going, um, how they feel about current trends, you know, in the in the field, and anything interesting that might pique the interest of our community. So it's such a great chance to have this informal view of, of a serious academic issue or you know research area. And I think it's a valuable chance to learn up close and personal from the scholars that we highlight for the day. And that's why we're so happy to have um, Dr. Freitas today to share um, her thoughts, her findings on such an interesting topic. And I know we were speaking about it beforehand and I said, I think it's, it's a topic that many um, students or many uh, people in the field of you know, ESL teaching, EFL teaching, second language learning and teaching can relate to. So I think it's such an interesting chance to listen to her today and um, of course in the future to listen and learn from other scholars as well. Um, so with that being said, I think it's time for Dr. Freitas to begin her talk. Um, so just so everybody knows, it is being recorded um, and this can be viewed later on, I believe on the Searle website. Um, either way, if you wanna keep your cameras on, that would be awesome. If not, that's also great. Um, that's not a problem as well. Um, feel free to um, think of any questions or anything you might want to ask Dr. Freitas afterwards. Um, I have a feeling this is going to be a bit of an interactive talk, so you might be speaking a little earlier than you expected. Um, so with that being said, um, Dr. Freitas, the virtual floor is yours. Well, I'm just going to interrupt just oh. before that, and I'm going mm -hmm. to say a little bit about Dr. Freitas. Uh, Dr. Freitas is a lifelong learner who loves teaching and is passionate about what she does. She is a full-time professor at Sheridan College, where she teaches and advises in the TESOL program and ESL programs, and she has been involved academically and professionally in English language teaching for over 15 years. Danielle, Dr. Freitas holds a PhD in the language and literacies education with a specialization in comparative international and development education from the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education of the University of Toronto. She had a master's degree in second language education with specialization in CD, CDE from OISE, University of Toronto, and a master's degree in TESOL from the Institute of Education uh, of the University College oh, London. Awesome. Yeah, UCL. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Freitas also holds several teaching qualifications from the University of Cambridge, including CELTA, ICELT, and DELTA, and it's a TESL Canada, a TESL Ontario, and a CELTA teacher educator. She has taught ESL and trained English language teachers in Brazil, England, USA, and Canada, and has published papers and presented at local and international conferences on various topics, including teacher identity, teacher learning and development and assessment. When not working, she enjoys eating popcorn <laughs> while watching Netflix with her husband and also going for walks in the neighborhood. 
She has fun singing with Alexa and hopes one day she will have free time to return to her favorite sport growing up in Brazil. I don't know if I should say it or if we should save it for the <laughs> bowling. What do you want? <laughs> no, you can say that. <laughs> her favorite sport in Brazil is roller skating. Yes. Yay. <laughs> so with that, the floor is hers. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephanie and Myron, for this wonderful introduction. I am delighted to be here today. Uh, thank you for everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm really hoping we can all engage in rich conversations and really reflect on what it means to support our student teachers, right? Their development, their learning and developing during their programs. So thank you again. Um, as Stephanie and Myron mentioned, I really planned a more interactive talk as this is a tea time uh, research circle. I'm, I'm hoping we can really have a more informal conversation where I share a little bit more about, uh, about my work and we can all engage in, in as I said, rich discussions. Okay, so um, let me start sharing here. Okay. Um, give me a second, please. Yeah. And I'm making sure I can see the chat box in case you want to make some comments or um, I ask for comments or you have any questions, as Stephanie said please uh, feel free to use the chat box. And Myron also said, you're gonna be participating a bit earlier than the end of the discussion. So feel free, I will follow um, your comments or questions in the chat box. All right, so um, let's get started. Um, I will, today I will focus on cognitive and emotional contradictions and how we can use these in order to support uh, teacher learning and development. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the agenda for today. So um, in order to talk a little bit more about uh, teacher learning and development and using these contradictions to support this process, I will share a bit more of my doctoral research with you. Uh, and um, I'll give you some, a, a very brief, background of the study um, so you can actually understand a bit more. So that's why we have the background and the rationale in there. Then we're going to maybe look at uh, teacher learning and development, um, like the theory behind it. So how we conceptualize it, what at least one way we can conceptualize it, what it really means in terms of theory. Then we're going to really um, have fun hopefully looking at Robert and Shannon. So these were two participants in my doctoral study and we will look at their experiences in the program. Okay, um, and this will give us a lot of um, important input and information to really think about what it means to support our student teachers, teacher learning and development, right? And how we can do that. Um, and then lastly, I will talk about the implications. Um, maybe it's three points for us to think about and engage um, later on in, in our discussion. Okay, and, and that's the, the plan for today. So let's just start with the background. And I think whenever you are doing or you're conducting your research study, we need to think about the so what question, right? So supervisors love to ask, so what? Why are you doing it? So, and that's how I started to this. So why, why should we study English language teachers? Um, and I think it's pretty obvious <laughs> in, in many ways, uh, but uh, just to state maybe the obvious here, it's like we think about globalization, we think about mobility, right? Not with COVID, physical mobility now, it's not allowed anymore. But if we think about online mobility, look how wonderful that is. Uh, we have, I think Maria from Chile here, and we have different people now, mobility, online mobility is 
even greater. So it's very important that we think about um, this context and what it means is that we really need English language teachers and we need English teachers, English language teachers now more than ever, right? And with that um, comes a need for us to rethink what language teacher education means. Um, what we had in the past really can't explain or um, doesn't really cover the uh, phenomenon that we have nowadays, right? So what we have, and, and it's always changing, right? We, we were talking about the pandemic, but uh, what we had at the beginning of the pandemic, now a year later is very different, right? For, it, that portion is very different from what we have now. So this constant need to rethink what we do, uh, our field and how to best support our students is very important. And um, when we think about language teacher education, we're going to narrow the scope a bit more here. And we're going to focus on what is usually called teacher training certificates or initial entry level qualifications to the ELT, so ELT, English language teaching profession, right? So you might have a herd of TESOL, TESOL, TEFL, CELTA, Trinity Search, so different acronyms to um, talk about that initial course that you have taken in order to become an English language teacher, right? And that's the context of the study today, because if we, we're going to see that this is really important. Many, 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 many millions <laughs> of English teachers, they will start teaching after having taken their um, teacher training certificate. Right now, my plan is to actually learn a bit more about you now. And if you please um, can, can choose, you should see a, an option now. Um, sorry. And my question is Are you an ESL, EFL, EAP, EAL English teacher? Um, if so, you can say yes, and um, if not, no. Um, I'm going to give you about 30 more seconds to think <laughs> um, or to have access to the polling um, options. Okay, so let's, I believe we still need one more person, but that's it. So you can see the results. That is wonderful. Most of us here are English language teachers, right? And if you are not, that's okay. This is still interesting. <laughs> um, and um, that's wonderful. So my next question for you is, have you taken a TESOL, TESOL, TEFL, CELTA, right? And any other teacher training qualification? You can choose your answer. All right, we are still missing maybe one more person. I'll give you 30 more seconds. Okay, so let's see the results. Very interesting. So 57% um, have taken um, TESOL or TESOL or CELTA qualification and maybe 43 have not. So that's going to be interesting for us to have a discussion later on in terms of what it uh, means, right? Um, so thank you for participating. Um, now, when I, as I mentioned, if you look at, there, there are a number of um, teacher training um, courses out there. Um, and in our context here in Canada, uh, we have the TESOL Canada. Um, so if you want to teach in Canada, most likely you will have a TESOL Canada certificate or an accreditation. Uh, in, in the context of Ontario, where OISE is, we also have another qualification that's called TESOL Ontario. So if you want to teach in colleges or link programs, which are uh, language instructions for newcomers to Canada, 
uh, programs you need just Ontario. And we also have CELTA, right? CELTA is not really a Canadian certificate, but it's an international certificate. It's from the University of Cambridge and it's very, very popular around the world. So um, if we think about our context, we can talk a little bit more about these three certificates, right? And um, my talk today is really going to focus on CELTA. And um, then the so what question again, right? So why are you uh, focusing on CELTA? Why do you really need to study CELTA? Why can't you study another teacher training certificate or even something else? Well, there are many reasons, right? So if we are, as we said before, we're thinking about the, an entry qualification to the English language teaching profess, uh, profession, then CELTA is the gold standard. And uh, this is internationally um, in, in, in Canada. Uh, why? Because it's, again, uh, the University of Cambridge has its label in there. So it's, um, there is a, a benchmark for quality. Um, and there's a lot of marketing that goes on as well. The fact of the matter is that it is a, it's, it's like a currency. So if you have a CELTA certificate, uh, no matter where you have taken it, you can teach virtually everywhere, everywhere in the world, right? So I have taken my CELTA back in Brazil. I came to Canada and started teaching right away just with my CELTA. If you have taken your CELTA in, in, in Japan, you come to the USA, you, you go anywhere and you can start teaching right away. So that's the, the international currency that I'm referring to there. And before the pandemic, the, the four week face-to-face -face course was the most popular, but now um, it's online. So you can take your CELTA online and it's usually the online version now, it's a full-time version and most centers are offering it in five weeks. And that's still the most uh, popular delivery option, but um, again, you can take it part-time and in places where you can have face-to-face -face education, you might be able to, to take it face-to-face -face or in blended options, right? So um, the, it's the impact and significance of CELTA in our English language teaching profession is, is huge. Um, you see like um, Facebook groups or LinkedIn groups, or if you Google it, you're going to find lots of services where people are actually um, helping um, student teachers to succeed in the CELTA course, right? So you have a whole industry around the CELTA uh, program because um, as we said before, it, it has currency. Uh, you can, with one, you can teach anywhere you want, teach English as a second language, right? Or, or EFL as a foreign language. However, what we see is that most research studies that are conducted in, in LTE, language teacher education, they are conducted in university settings, like in bachelor's degrees or master's degrees or doctoral degrees. And, and there is a reason for that. Usually, um, professors in our field will start like us as uh, English language teachers, then they'll go on to do their masters and PhDs and they'll become professors. And usually um, they will um, start or they will continue their research where they work, right? In their university or in, in like degree programs in their context. So, the certificate programs, they don't really get the attention of the profs anymore or the researchers anymore because they are entry level qualification. Um, they are only four weeks or five weeks um, and other reasons as well, of course. Um, and the, in by no, this is not a, a criticism by um, no means, but it's just saying like one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of studies is that um, researchers don't really, um, they're not interested in researching certificate programs, right? And so the consequence is that we have very little research and we don't know much about what goes on 
into these four weeks or five weeks or what's the, the duration of the program, right? So it can even be like a longer program, but we don't know what happens in there. We don't know how uh, student teachers learn how to teach and develop as English teachers. And it's a shame because if you look at uh, the profession, most people will have a certificate. Very, very few people will start teaching with a master's degree. And very, 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 very few people will start teaching with a doctoral degree. So the fact of the matter is that the industry, like the profession, is made of people who have certificate programs, right? So that really shows how important uh, research in this context is. Um, and um, hopefully uh, the work uh, I'm doing and our discussion here today will help us understand a bit more of this context, right? Um, so, um, let's look at teacher learning and development and trying to conceptualize it, um, understand it from a more theoretical perspective. Uh, what I did in, in my, my research and what I use in my own work is a social cultural perspective of language teacher education. And uh, so SCT, right? So I work from an SCT uh, perspective. And um, when we think about um, SCT, we really need to think about the environment and how the environment is constitutive of the activity. So this means that if we focus on teachers, right? So what we say like the teacher cognition really originates in and is fundamentally shaped by the environment, meaning the activities that the teachers engage in, right? So the program, uh, it's not just another variable, but the program really constitute, right? Uh, like it's part of, it's what makes the teacher, um, the teacher that she or he will be, right? Um, and so, um, and if we think about uh, development and this connects to what we're going to talk about later in terms of contradiction, um, for Vygotsky, human development is really this contradictory process, and it's really um, characterized by longer periods of gradual growth, right? But it's it's really interspersed with shorter periods of crisis, and the literature just describes crisis in many different ways. So some people uh, will think about crisis as a transformational moment. Other people will say, well, this is a um, critical incident. So there are many ways you can actually understand this crisis in there. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that, that that period of crisis, like overcoming that period of crisis will lead you to, um, according to Vygotsky, qualitatively restructure your um, mental processes or your higher mental functions, right? So that, that's important for us to understand because we'll talk about contradictions and this means that there is no development without contradictions, right? That's what it really means. So we can't really um, develop completely without hitting an obstacle in our path and really overcoming that obstacle, right? Um, and then from, if when, again, when we get Vygotsky and we look um, at language teacher education programs, uh, Johnson and Gollenbeck really say, you know what, in a, in a teacher's life, right? So they start learning to be a teacher and then after, but if you think about the program, the program is really that period of crisis. You can understand the program as that period of crisis, right? So um, teachers, when they are in, or student teachers, when they are in their, edu their teacher education programs, they will uh, face a lot of contradictions. They will, have lots of problems. So, and that's why we say that the period, like the, the, 
teacher education program is really a period of crisis. <laughs> it's maybe not, it doesn't sound really <laughs> uh, encouraging, <laughs> uh, but it, if we remember that without crisis, we cannot develop, that is really encouraging. It means that we really need to face the crisis. What really makes the difference is how and how the teacher educators will support you through that period of crisis, right? Um, and one of the reasons why this is so difficult and the, like there is a in crisis, again, you can interpret it as dissonance or critical incidents in many different ways, because sometimes the word crisis is a bit strong. So what really, one of the, the reasons is that usually teacher education programs will say, go and teach or we'll give you some content and we'll ask you to teach, or sometimes we'll give you a lot of content and say, now you're ready to teach. However, um, when you start teaching, you don't really have the pedagogical content knowledge to know what teaching is. And you're going to acquire that pedagogical content knowledge by teaching. So um, you can't really have something without doing it, right? So which is, the same for roller skating or playing the piano or any other skill, you really need to actually do it so that you acquire that content knowledge in there. And that's the key developmental role of performance preceding competence, really, right? That uh, we say, so you really need to perform it and perform it. And of course you need content as well so that uh, you develop that competence. So one of, um, and this is one of the reasons why we have these crises, right? Or, or crises and, and um, why it's so difficult sometimes for student teachers to go through their programs. Um, and so um, let's hear from you now. Um, so some of you, um, actually most of you said that you have taken, right, your certificate. Uh, and those of you who have not taken a certificate, maybe you know someone who has, right? And you can participate as well. So did you or someone you know experience any periods of crisis during their program? Okay, so please let us know. And again, crisis doesn't need to be a huge thing or an existential crisis, but maybe a, an obstacle or something that um, happened in the program and it was really difficult for you um, to overcome. Okay. Um, I'll give you maybe 30 more seconds. We still have some people to choose. Final countdown. All right. So let's see here. Um, oh, look at that. For those of you who participated, you guys really faced uh, periods of crisis. I did too. <laughs> um, and we can talk about it later, uh, but um, I did too. And um, Maybe for those of you who actually said yes, if you want to share a bit more in the chat box, um, any insights or anything you'd like to share with us, um, you know, um, so we can maybe learn a little bit more about um, your um, experiences and maybe even compare your experiences to what we're going to talk about in terms of Shannon and Robert and the experiences in the, the course as well. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave it up to you and please feel free to, to share uh, in the chat box. And as we go along, we will can comment. All right, so um, let's look at Shannon now. Um, so Shannon, um, Oh, that's great. So um, Tolka um, shared a bit here. So before we actually go to Shannon, 
let's see, I remember having a crisis just about to finish my undergraduate degree, mainly because I did not feel comfortable with coping with life as an adult. That's very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. Karen, in the EAP context, pacing and getting students to be engaged. Yes, I, I can relate. I think many of us can relate with both of uh, your comments here. Um, it's really difficult sometimes to stand in front of other people and feel like a teacher. Sometimes you have students who are much older than you are. Um, sometimes there are uh, many different um, reasons why it's difficult to feel comfortable with uh, you being the teacher, being the adult in the room. And in the EAP context, oh my gosh, sometimes students are there and they don't want to do the work. Um, and um, it was really uh, sometimes a challenge, right? To get them engaged and say, this is for you, please. This is good for you. <laughs> um, great, Myron said, remember that you are the teacher of being exactly, that's another challenge, right? Um, it's, um, I think being at school, it's really uh, an interesting, experience and we can talk more about it I always say that the best PD is to send your teachers back to school when they really have to be assessed by other teachers or professors or and they have to kind of think about their grades and think about what they're going to say right so that for me was one of the best PDs is like always go back to school and get your teachers to be assessed um, so thank you again for sharing I hope we can uh, continue this conversation uh at uh maybe at the end of the presentation um great so let's look uh look at shannon again um shannon uh, and again the context is the celta course okay um and a very intense that was a face-to-face -face course um and um very intensive course um they had classes from 8 a.m to 6 p.m like with maybe half an hour break or lunch. Sometimes they do not even take their breaks. So crazy, crazy busy. Um, Shannon uh, was Canadian, um, 40 years old, um, female. Um, she spoke English as her L1. Um, she did, uh, she lived in Japan and Korea for sometimes so she taught there so she spoke Japanese and Korean as well she spoke French she grew up here and um, her heritage language was Jamaican Creole and uh, she completed a bachelor's of arts in English um, so that's a, a little bit of, um, of Shannon um, and we'll look at her experiences in the CELTA program Right. As you can see, she felt really strongly about the course in general, and she was really vocal. So as a, as a researcher, Shannon was like a godsend because she was just like, she would say everything that was in her mind. She was the one that got her diary and like I gave her two diaries and she would write and write and write. So, she was wonderful in that way. And, and she really expressed how emotionally extraneous the, the taxing the course was for her, you know? Um, and just, again, just a little bit for you to have an idea uh, of what uh, she was feeling and how she was feeling through the course. She said, this has hijacked my life uh, and my self-esteem. And I still had to pay for it. like what is this, right? I remember she said, this has been the most expensive guided discovery of my life. So there is a technique that uh, they teach in CELTA that's called guided discovery, that it's like um, a way to teach maybe grammar, for example. And then she was just making an analogy saying, how come I had to pay for it, right? Um, then um, a bit more of what she was uh, going through here. And I'll give you some um, seconds maybe to read.
right? So you can see how intensely hurtful that was for her. She just felt that she was being hurt and she did not even realize because it was just so much. She couldn't even process the information. Um, like you are giving me so much and what I'm supposed to do with this, just give me a break, right? Um, so that I think I, I chose this quotation here because that really shows how um, emotionally taxing it was for her. Um, it was the whole thing. It was the whole time and no break and just feeling like under attack all the time, right? Um, so if we go back and think about who Shannon was, she had been teaching for four years prior to taking the course. So she already had lots of experience and she, um, and she was teaching at, back again in Japan and Korea. Um, however, um, she failed her TP. So TP stands for teaching practice. So her, her teaching practice lesson six, she had to teach nine, I believe, and she failed her uh, lesson number six. Um, and she had to uh, complete four assignments and she did not pass the assignment first submission. So she got feedback and she had to resubmit that assignment and she could fail the assignment, right? So that was really, really difficult for her uh, to really think about herself as a teacher a teacher who had been teaching for four years, had done so much, and then um, taking this course, which she knew she would it would be difficult, but you know, failing a lesson um, and not like and at, at some point she said, you know, I was uh, I was really good at school. My undergrad I was the best. I never had I never failed an assignment. So that was really kind of going deep into her identity um, and in, in her reflection she she mentioned um, you know the fail lesson and she mentioned the assignment and she started to question her own identity um, and this is again a very I think important quotation for us to think about um, in her interview she she talked about you know how the fail and then and and she cried and she really cried um and she was saying i'm not really sh i'm not sure and like how do i know that i should be a teacher after four years teaching and um you know thinking that i am okay to do this thing and then i come here and these people say well you 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 didn't pass and then you you have to submit this assignment, right? How do I know? They are just being polite and saying, oh, you're okay, but you're not. You should quit because you're not enough, right? How many failures do I have to, uh, to have before I realize that this is not for me. I have to reevaluate my life who I am, right? So that is um, the kind of crisis she was going through. Right, very, um, very deep. Um, she was really questioning, like, her life as a teacher. Um, and that's we're gonna stop, um, and we're gonna move on and think about Robert. Okay, so Robert was an American, um, and again, forty-four years old, male, spoke um, English as his first language, and. Uh, also uh, spoke a bit of Japanese. He married a Japanese um, lady and their plan was to go to Japan um, and have their family in there, just live in there. And he thought that teaching English would be a great way to do that. He was a successful uh, business. Uh, he was in business before, business and finance. Um, quite successful career, and he was transitioning because of their their plans to move to Japan. And um, he also had a background in biblical and theolo 
theological studies. And, of, and he did not any he did not have any prior teaching experience because he was again in business uh, prior to the course. Okay, so that's a, uh, a, an overview of Robert. And differently from Shannon, Robert had a, a very uh, positive um, old, like experience in the program. And his overall emotions were also positive towards the, the program. And uh, like after his first teaching practice lesson, he, he wrote in his reflection that uh, he was, he felt comfortable. He was very afraid of standing in front of the students as a teacher for the first time. And he felt comfortable and he felt that students really kind of got it. He was a teacher, right? So that was a, an interesting um, reflection, like to show his identity here, right? Like, no, I, I, I am a teacher. I, I was not sure, but I, I think students actually see me as a teacher now, right? So, um, and Robert passed all the assignments, did well. Um, and he was teaching his first TP lessons, um, like no fail, pass standard, nothing, um, you know, um, that could um, cause any problems in there. Um, again, he was a serious, hardworking student teacher and was really uh, very engaged throughout the program. And as we mentioned, that's a very intensive program. Um, but he, he would say, you know, sometimes I was like, just it. I didn't want to be there at all the afternoons. We would have this input sessions but you know I was engaged and the material was good and I, I made sure that I was paying attention and was there um, and however Robert also had uh, a breaking point that he, as he put it this is um, his words a real intense moment and that was prior to teaching um, his lesson number six um, and as you can see here, um, he was really afraid, and this was his words, he would not survive the course. Uh, and he was working really, really hard, and he just felt he was not improving. And then like Shannon, she was questioning, is this for me? He was saying, you know what? I'm working really hard, um, TPs five and six, taking a lot of efforts, I don't sleep, I work so hard, and um, what's going on? Um, I'm just trending in the wrong direction. I don't understand. The more I work, the worse I become. Um, and he started to question this whole thing, and um, that was a very difficult time for him. So moving on from his uh, third lesson to his fourth lesson to his fifth lesson, that was a, a critical period for him. Um, and that's how we can really um, see here. Some of, we can frame maybe um, their cognitive and emotional contradictions, right? Shannon being a teacher for four years, um, comes to the course and then suddenly fails a lesson and has to resubmit an assignment, something that has never happened to her before. And then Robert, very hardworking from a different field, used to getting things done, kind of works a lot each time more and feels, feels that his grades and performance, they are not improving, right? So is it, something doesn't, add up here for them, right? They don't understand what's going on. Um, so, and that's what I'm calling here contradiction. And, and as you can see, it is really emotional. And it's not just about what they are thinking, but it's all about how they are feeling. It's how they are feeling and how they are thinking, because we can't really separate how we feel from how we think, right? Um, and how about, again, and that's now for us, time for us to think a bit more about you. Um, if we think about your experiences, if you think about Shanna's experiences, Robert's experiences, 
do you think the teacher educators they can mediate they can use the the contradictions we saw to support their development right and uh, we should be able to see the options there And again, both both students were in the course, so these um, contradictions were happening happening as a result of their experiences in the course, their experience in engaging in the activities in the course. Um, so the question is, can the teachers or the teacher educators do something about it, right? Because they are there in the course. And Danielle, I'm just yeah. going to interrupt because a couple people came in since we might have done our, our first poll. Mm -hmm. So okay. just letting everybody know that there is a poll in might be in front of you on your screen for you to participate in answering Danielle's question uh, with a yes or a no. Going awesome. forward. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stephanie. Exactly. Um, so let me show you uh, the results. Um, here and yes, everybody who participated believes that yes, the teacher educator can do something about it, right? Uh, and uh, yes, that's hopefully the the point of this talk here today is that the teacher educator can do something about it, but also the student and the peers they can also do something about it. So, um, that really. Um, that's the point of the poll here, right? So teacher educators can help students face their periods of crisis. Um, and we really need to identify and mediate these contradictions, um, the contradictions that happen in um, our student teachers learning and development journey, right? Now, then you probably ask me how, when we were talking about how we're gonna do this, Right? Uh, you say that yes, they, we suffer, <laughs> we are in crisis. The teacher educators can help us, but how? And we're going to look at an example of it. Look at an example and the example that um, it's, it's uh, with Robert. So the teacher educator that was in the course with Robert, um, Jasmine, she did do a good job. And we're going to look at uh, some of what she did, and then we can discuss a little bit more. Um, so just a little bit more context for you to understand what she did. Robert, I told you he was kind of in crisis after GP four, five, and six, working a lot and just thinking that this is not working. I'm working more and I'm getting worse. I'm not improving. I think it's time to quit. <laughs> And what he did, he said, you know what, before I teach this, before I go on, let me go and talk to my teacher educator and I'll tell her what's going on, what I'm thinking, and maybe this is not good for me and, and et cetera, right? So um, in the, reflecting on that moment, um, that's what um, Robert was saying you know, leading up to it. So leading up to TP6, like four, five, and six, I was just kind of beside myself, very discouraged, right? So, and then I went to talk to Jasmine and that was a crit that was critical for me. So he identified that as, as a critical moment for him, right? He was in crisis in there. And um, on the other hand, when I was talking to Jasmine and I, I just asked her, so, what comes to your mind? What immediately comes to your mind when you think about your students? I didn't say any names, I said about your students. And then she said, well, you know, the thing that stands out to me is when Robert came into, uh, that came in that morning and he was like, oh, I don't know if I can make it or I don't know if this is for me. And then she said, um, it just reminds me that it's my responsibility. I was talking to me, I'm also a teacher educator. It's our responsibility to keep reminding students that in the CELTA course, right? That she was in the context of the CELTA, the standard moves. Um, and it doesn't, it, 
it's not the same um, if you get above standard in, meaning you do a lot more in TP2 um, and you've got a great, a good grade for it. It doesn't mean it, if you get a below standard in TP6, that doesn't mean that you, you're not improving. It, the standard moves, the course gets harder. So if you keep getting passes, this means that you're improving, even if you're working more because, and then she keeps repeating the standard moves, right? So it's my responsibility to tell them, listen, you're not getting worse. It's not the case. It's just because that's the way the course is set up. Every time you're demanded a bit more. So if you keep getting just passes, this means that you're okay, right? And um, you know, and, and that's what I, I think that was very important here for us to, to focus on is that she, she said, that's my responsibility, right? Um, and that's what I need to do. I need to make sure that they understand, they understand that they're not failing. They're not, they don't feel that uh, they are not good enough because of their grades. They understand that the course is set up like that, right? And another thing was an interesting was she said uh, their emotions can really get into the way of them developing and get them. And, and that's her job was to get them back and thinking logically, right? And uh, here it's like what she really said, like uh, her own words. Um, and she was saying, you know, sometimes when they are planning the lessons, they just overthink it, overthink it or think about it too much. And then something goes wrong and then all the, those emotions, right? And then they start doubting themselves. But you say, you know, yes, you can do it. Like as a teacher or educator, you have to reassure them, right? Um, this is uh, really what you have to do. Um, great. Um, and after the conversation with, um, Jasmine, um, Robert was really able to reconceptualize his performance in the course. Um, and he actually changed the way he thought about himself, he saw himself, and he behaved in the course. So he was able to actually take uh, actions that helped him as a result of the new reconceptualization she, he had because of the conversation he had with Jasmine, right? Um, and he said he was, it was very helpful. You know, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. And then I thought, you know, maybe I'm not getting worse really. I'm just kind of doing okay. I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. And then after that, after the talk, he actually looked at his plan and made some changes and he was very proud of it. He taught a good lesson and his last lesson, he got an above standard. And so he it really changed the way he behaved, he thought, he saw himself. Just, of course, it was not just Jasmine's uh, mediation, but it really helped him um, refocus, right? Um, so with that, I think that it's a clear example for us to really think about how critical it is for teacher educators not to dismiss their student teachers cognitive emotional contradictions, because what really happens in CELTA and many other courses is that students start to freak out and then teach education to go, yeah, just like, yeah, dramatics or yeah, just the normal, usual little dramas we have. Oh yeah, it's just not in emotional, emotional nonsense, right? But actually those emotions are signaling the contradictions that are happening in the teacher learning and development journey. So we really need to pay attention to those signs, right? And they are usually displayed um, via like different attitudes or behavior or performance, dropping performance. Or so as teachers, we need to really know our students well because it is by knowing our students that we're going to be able to know the signals right, and see, well, this student's really great, but there's something going on here. I don't know what's going on here, but there is something going on here, right? So 
And again, I, I caution here because as teachers, we are not psychologists. And this is very important to be said. So you're not a psychologist, um, but you really need to um, keep in mind that as a teacher educator, you can mediate your students' cognitive and emotional contradictions. And by doing that, you can support their development in the course, right? So now just a little bit um, for, for thought here, I think we really need to think about the place of emotions in the teacher learning development process. Um, I think uh, coming from the Enlightenment era and all the cognitive stuff we are used to seeing in our field. And I know we nowadays we talk about an emotional turn. We have, again, an identity turn, an emotional turn, but really what it really means in our programs, right? Not only in the literature, but what does it mean in our own classrooms, right? How are we using our emotions and not only our student teachers emotion but our emotions is another thing we need to think about right we've been talking a lot about it the role of teacher educators um what is your role as a teacher educator in uh the program you teach um do you um how do you um approach your students how you uh understand their their journey how you mediate your emotions um, their contradictions, right? The cognitive and emotional contradictions we've been talking about. And most importantly, we won't have time to talk about it, but that's a huge part of my, my work too, is that um, the role that the students, and not only the students, but their peers, the role that they play uh, in mediating their contradictions and in becoming self-regulated teachers, right? Because we talk about emotions, but it's very important that we become self-regulated um, teachers in relation to our emotions. Can we regulate our emotions in the classroom? When students come to you, you're teaching and they say, I hate you, you are awful. I don't understand a word you say. How do you, re how do you regulate your emotions? Because you're gonna go like, right? Maybe, <laughs> what am I gonna do? Like, how can like how do we teach our students to become self-regulated teachers not only in relation to their cognitive higher mental functions but in relation to their emotional intelligence right i think there's a lot for us to talk about uh, again i'd like to thank you very much for being here uh, and look forward to again engaging in a wonderful discussion uh, now Oh, Dr. Freitas, thank you thank so you. much. That was really great and really rich and really novel because so much of our talks about as uh, scholars and academics in the areas of language and literacies is about the teaching side, which is so important mm -hmm. and we're trying to figure it out and, and all of that. Uh, but we don't often um, consider even the social emotional side mm -hmm. of the teacher or mm -hmm. and in particular this microcosm of the uh, ESL or EFL teacher who has a whole other ball of wax mm -hmm. uh, teaching a language and also the unwritten kind of um, cultural curriculum mm -hmm. of where they are Mm -hmm. wherever this is happening in the world. So yeah. um, caring about the interpersonal, social, emotional part of the human who has taken on the role to uh, these roles, as far mm -hmm. as language transmission or language teaching and mm -hmm. learning um, is huge because it's not really something that's focused on and not for children either. We don't often yeah. look at the socio-emotional, um, uh, we don't often prioritize looking at that. And as a result, we have a global mental youth health mm -hmm. crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so, and with teachers after COVID, yeah. uh, it's gonna be a whole thing too. So yeah. thank you, like so, from the heart, like really important work. And okay. we open the floor to everybody to talk about 
your own experiences perhaps as a teacher and your emotional world, your emotional experiences in that process as a student teacher and also in the field. So please feel free to unmute your mic and share or into the chat box, you can put whatever bits. Yeah. I think I, I can say something while everybody thinks. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really something that you said that made me think like the whole emotional aspect of like the teacher. I was thinking like, it's it's kind of, it's almost like you're placed in a box, if you will, in the classroom because you're that, you yourself are now that support system for the students, mm -hmm. right? So in a sense, you can't, I mean, even though you might be feeling all kinds of emotions yourself, you might not be able to outwardly express that anymore. Mm -hmm. Because if you crumble per se, then everything goes down, in theory, goes mm -hmm. down with you. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's really interesting that, you know, you're kind of highlighting that and kind of think about ways that it can be dealt with, or, you know, maybe have some sort of outlet for teachers to be able to, um, you know, I don't know, vent is the right word, but to kind of mm -hmm. um, create a space for, for teachers that are maybe feeling overwhelmed by whatever it is, it could be in the classroom, or if it's a student teacher, like um, people who might be overwhelmed by standing in front of um, a class of students and not know what to say, or, you know, stage fright or, you know, whatever. So I think it's really interesting. And I'm just wondering, like, do you think there's, there's not one answer, obviously, but what do you think are some ways that, you know, maybe institutions or the schools itself can set up some kind of support system for the teachers in that regard? Yeah, that is wonderful. Like, um, I'm so glad you raised this point here. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to maybe acknowledge or thank some of my student teachers that are here today. So uh, Shuya and Jalissa, they're here participating. Um, and I think, again, my, my work was during their program. And so as teacher educators, so I'll speak to that and then we can I'll maybe uh, go uh, beyond and think about the school in general. Um, so in, in, in the program, um, they teach and then they have to have a feedback session with peers and the teacher to create a educator, which is a bit frightening because you have people talking about your own lessons um, and kind of really appraising the lesson, saying what went well and what did not go so well, and the teacher educator also doing that, right? So, um, so that is per se a very difficult uh, situation to be in. So um, one thing that I, I try and do is to make sure that um, they, they know that the group is a safe space. Um, so we need to really focus on um, making sure we create a positive environment and a space where they can safely share uh, their emotions. And after teaching, I always give them the space to vent. And I use this word, that's your time to vent. Sometimes, uh, maybe you don't want to vent, but you maybe you just celebrate. Is your time to vent or your time to celebrate? Sometimes we want to celebrate, sometimes we want to vent, say, what's going on? That was awful. I planned a lot, right? And that um, really did not go well. So I think one way that we can incorporate is it's really creating a safe space where student teachers feel free and feel safe to share, to vent, to celebrate, to express their emotions, something which is not allowed in the classroom, by the way, right? We are not allowed to express our emotions in the classroom. Um, we have to kind of pretend they don't exist or bottle them up. Uh, put, the, right? put the mask on. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a, a similar actions can be done within the school environment. Um, the most important thing is really creating that community of practice where teachers feel safe to share. Um, our profession is sometimes described as an eggshell profession, like teachers are all in the box, but within their own <laughs> classrooms. 
right? Um, so we need to kind of create an omelet a little bit, you know, kind of put everybody in the same pan and kind of start sharing whatever, like, you know, celebrate, um, really expressing who we are um, within the boundaries we have. And I think that's, I'm going to finish by saying that I think an omelet is a great metaphor for us at almost six here in Toronto to have our dinners. Wonderful, Danielle. I love that. Uh, omelet would be perfect for dinner, yeah. especially if someone else makes it for me. I'm happy to do dishes. Um, what a great talk and really so important to talk about the human being, uh, the heart the, the heart of each of us uh, uh, as, as teachers and as human beings, students, whatever our roles are. And really, really crucial. And um, if we have those kind of priorities in our school milieu, whether it's mm -hmm. post-secondary or um, elementary, middle school and high school, we'll be so much better off for it. And um, thank you so much. I yeah. know that we want to discuss more. Yeah. So yeah, we look forward to a sequel with mm -hmm. you continuing the talk about the student teacher and the emotional being within and the contradictions and experiences. We thank you so much, Dr. Freitas, for being our guest speaker of our <laughs> Tea Time Research Circle from Searle University of Toronto, OISE. Uh, we just want to remind everybody that this coming Wednesday, May the 5th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we'll be having another tea time with Alicia Rategi and Sofia Garcia, a talk about a technical perspective on peer review as a strategy to improve students' writing skills. So we look forward to the future with you, yeah. uh, future talk and future in-person roller skating. Yeah. Thank Definitely. you so much for your time, everybody and be My well. Pleasure. Bye bye everybody.